Ladies and gents, welcome to the UX and this is First Opium War, Gunboat Diplomacy, Extra Street Part 3 by the channel Extra Credits. Yeah, First Opium War. <laughs> this has been awesome so far. So British addiction to tea uh, basically led to all this shit, right? I mean, they love their tea. I mean, it became uh, so popular that there was a pretty good sum of revenue for the entire, you know, British Empire. So they're like, yeah, we, we, we want that shit. So what they did was, you know, they... they took poppy seeds and things from the India, created opium and trying to sell in China just so they could afford to buy a lot of amount of tea, right? To offset all the uh, debt they owe so far because they were in really bad place because all the wars in India and losing the Americas except Canada. So in that sense, you know, uh, they, they are really in debt. So they are like, okay, we'll do that. So they became a drug dealer. Basically, biggest empire ever became a drug dealer just to offset, you know, the debt they have. Yeah, this is literally breaking bad. They need money, so they are going to fuck it. We're going to sell opium. Chinese, uh, being a different culture, they didn't care about uh, trading that much as much they care about their, you know... Uh, care about how outside influence would corrupt their people and shit like that a bit of backwards thinking but you know it's understandable where they were at the point so you know they're like okay fuck that you know but let's keep uh, british influence as minimum and now since opium is coming they restricted opium because obviously it's a drug it would be a problem but now there's a real you know conflict between two uh, powers i don't think the open war has uh, broke out or uh, up until this point i think but they did set up hong kong an island near China because Chinese kick British out. So I guess in this one, gunboat diplomacy, I think British are going to kick back because British have the uh, most powerful navy in the world around this point. So yeah, that's what this one. Remember, if you like my reaction, if you like and subscribe, check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cars over place. Check out the cars. Yeah, let's watch it. Well, oops, sorry. Update ruined the settings apparently. I had to, you know, reconfigure the audio for it. Guns had been fired, lives had been lost, but full-scale war wasn't a certainty yet. The British set up a blockade. The Chinese were offering to let British captains dock so long as they signed a bond saying that they would never sell opium in China and were willing to be subject to Chinese law. But the British had already put out the order. No British ship was to trade with the Chinese. Tensions are high. Something would have to give. Okay. I don't get this. First of all, China didn't care about the trading, right? Because they're like, okay, we don't want your shit. We don't want your tr trading much. So they restricted as much as they can. But since now, British are out. They they are the one who's saying that no British ship should you know trade with Chinese. Chinese should be like, yeah, good. But they want to trade now. So they are actually openly letting people trade if you know as far as they don't bring opium. But now the British are the one like, okay, we don't want to trade. Aren't they in debt or something? Don't they need to sell opium and things like that by now or sell anything? Isn't that a bit costly to stop all the trading? On the 3rd of November, 1839, a British ship by the name of the Royal Saxon approached Canton. They were signaled to stop, to turn back, but they made a run for it. One of the British ships in the blockade fired a warning shot. It skipped past their bow. The cannon shot was heard from the shore. The Chinese admiral stationed at Canton made his decision. He would send out his fleet to protect the Royal Saxon. And so, a small host of junks and- <clears throat> Okay, so let me get this straight. British set up the blockade so no British ship would trade with Chinese. Uh, probably to, you know, stop some kind of conflict or something. So if they sell opium and, you know, uh, the Chinese ex execute them or something, that would cause real issues. Now, out of pride, British have to go to war openly or something like that. I'm pretty sure it's something like that. But still, you know, British set up the blockade. Uh, one of the merchant ships like, ah, oh, fuck that. I'm just going to make breakthrough. And, you know, British are fighting British and Chinese like, I'm going to save that British ship. That's just weird. <laughs> Fire ships began to pour out of the Canton Harbor. The situation was confused. The commander of the ship that originally fired requested permission to engage. Captain Elliot, the superintendent of British trade and the man who'd convinced the British merchants to hand over their opium in the first place, initially wavered, but the Chinese ships were bearing down hard. Another request to engage was made. The Chinese ships were festooned with red flags, the color of war. 
The honor of his nation and his flag would not allow Elliot to back down before such intimidation. The order was given, and the men engaged. Oh, shit. The first broadside Chinese are going to die. <laughs> British shells shredded one of the fire rafts. There was a cataclysmic explosion, a gout of flame and sea. One of the war junk's magazines had been hit. All that was left of it were burning planks carried by the waves. The ships turned to give another broadside, but the outmatched Chinese junks began to retreat. Only the proud admiral's flagship was left, standing defiantly, returning shot. But it was hopelessly outclassed and already damaged. Seeing the admiral standing alone, Elliot told his captains to cease fire. The point had been made, there was no need for meaningless slaughter. And so, seeing the sea- <laughs> No shit Chinese can't go against British ships, come on. Cease fire, the flagship turned and limped back to port. The first real battle of the Opium Wars had come and passed, with the British bombarding the Chinese forces for defending a British ship which they themselves had originally fired on. That's just weird. For some time after this, there was a lull. Some in China even thought that the British were too far away to seriously pursue a war. But the truth was, the British were simply mustering their forces. At that very moment, Marines and soldiers from there India were being redeployed and transported. I mean, why would somebody think that British are so far away? There's India. You know, British occupied India. They could literally set up that army there. ...to China. The latest ships were dispatched from British naval yards to serve in the fight. Many in the British Admiralty saw this as an excellent opportunity to field test the iron, steam, and sail ships that were just rolling off the lines. When the forces arrived, though, the British descended on the island of Tucson. The Chinese and British officials met, once on the Chinese flagship, once on the British ship. Each time, the British made their demands clear. Surrender the island and no one will be harmed. And each time, the Chinese responded in baffled disbelief. The Chinese officials told the British that, Hey, we never did you any harm. It's not right to punish us for the acts of those in Canton. They implored the British to turn away, but the British had their duty. And as the Chinese officials made clear on their way out, so did they. The next morning, the bombardment began. Soon, the Chinese forces retreated behind the walls of their city, and the British Marines landed unopposed. They set up their guns and then took the night to rest. By the next day, they found the city nearly deserted. Chusan had been captured with little loss of life, and the British had a jumping off point for their operations should they decide to threaten Shanghai. By this point, the Emperor had dismissed Lin Zexu, the righteous minister who he had so celebrated a short while before, and replaced him with an official named Qi Shan, who was empowered to treat with the British. Qi Shan and Elliot began to discuss a settlement. They haggled over reparation for the destroyed opium, and eventually came to a figure of six million pounds. But Elliot was still supposed to get territory for the British Empire that they could use for a port. He offered to return Chusan in exchange for some other island, but Qi Shen was not about to give away portions of sovereign China. And so the talks broke down. Then, as the new year passed, at least for the English, an opium runner, which had snuck its way into Canton, came back with the rumor that the Emperor intended to resume the war and attack the British. Elliot decided to preempt such an assault, though the wisdom of trusting unsubstantiated rumors coming from opium runners is a bit questionable. Yeah. Really, it's unlikely that such an attack was ever actually in the works. But working with the information he had, Elliot commanded the British forces to open fire on the Chinese fortifications at Chuen Pi near Canton on the morning of January 7th, 1841. The fighting lasted mere hours. The British guns ripped through the fortifications and silenced any counterbatteries with haste. Then, Indian and British Marines landed and rapidly pushed the Chinese ground forces back. Tragically, a rumor had been circulating among the Chinese that the British executed every prisoner they captured, and so many hopelessly fought on to the death, until their battalions were in tatters and their dead outnumbered their- Oh, who the fuck spread that rumor, right? I mean, I guess that rumor was spread by Chinese themselves, you know, the military and people like that, so Chinese people fight hard or something, but that's just fucked up, right? I mean, that didn't happen and they spread the rumor, so obviously everybody's going to be feared like they're going to kill us anyway. So they are going to fight with the last breath. That's just fucked up. Unnecessary slaughter now. They're living. By 11 in the morning, the British flag flew over the Chinese battlements. 600 Chinese lay dead. A meager 100 were captured. Among the British, only 30 were wounded, and those not even from enemy fire, but because of their pieces of artillery overheating and exploding. Meanwhile, the Nemesis, the iron steam and sail ship that was being tested in Chinese waters, demonstrated the power of its guns and rockets, dispatching junks and chasing away the Chinese fleet. 
Three further forts stood to be captured, but the next morning, a Chinese physician came under flag of truce to ask on behalf of Qishan. Despite the overwhelming desire of the troops to cut their way to Canton, Elliot acquiesced. Horrified by the slaughter he had just witnessed, he wrote to one of the British trades who was pushing the war that he hoped to resolve it without further bloodshed, and that if further conflict was necessary, it was clear that they could take what they wanted. So he agreed to meet. Soon, yeah. terms were hammered out. The Chinese would pay six million in reparations. The British would pay six million to buy the island of Hong Kong. Ambassadors would be exchanged, the Chinese agreed to not call the British tribute-bearing barbarians anymore, and the British would return all the forts and the territory that they had taken during the war. And most importantly, trade would resume in a much more free and... Okay, really? That's... Uh, British are being really fair here, uh, around this time especially. They got the six million, they say, okay, we're going to give you six million back for the Hong Kong. Usually I would have thought they're just like, okay, we also take Hong Kong. They would have gone like that. Uh, if not, then war is on or something like that. But yeah, they are being, you know, surprisingly understanding here. ...and open manner. So, problem solved. The Chinese get just about the best terms they could conceivably hope for under the circumstances, and the British get to fulfill their mission and open up a whole new empire for trade. There's been some bloodshed, but in the end, everybody's happy, right? Well, not exactly. Elliot's boss back in England, a fellow named Lord Palmerston, who will undoubtedly crop up in other episodes down the line, was not happy. The British Empire didn't get the massive sum of money he wanted as reparations for the opium that was destroyed. They didn't get to keep the territory that they'd conquered. They didn't get as many open ports as he would like, and perhaps most of all, he was livid that Elliot, who had never really been comfortable with the drug trade in the first place, didn't even ask that opium be legalized in China. So, Elliot, for his swift and nearly bloodless execution of the war, was dismissed and sent packing. There you go. I knew that was a bit true, uh, good to be true. Like, British, I don't know. British were not okay with that. Elliot was, right? And they fired him because of that. And Qi Shan. The emperor had to be ecstatic with these terms, right? I mean, the Chinese were clearly outmatched, and at the end of the day, all they had had to see yeah, was a be barren rock that in the middle of the ocean. Hong Kong Pretty is good deal, right? Well, the emperor was not so happy. In fact, he immediately recalled Qi Shan and ordered him executed for treason. Apparently, he thought they could have gotten a better deal. Uh, don't worry, Qi Shan lived, he's fine, but needless to say, neither party ever signed this treaty. So join us next time as all the voices of reason are removed from the Opium War. There you go. Ah, come on, British around this time was hardly voice of reason in any situation, so it's not surprising. They, they, it's, what's surprising thing to me is so far, they've been somewhat reasonable, right? I would have thought the war would have broken a long time ago. You know, all the troops had, you know, get, gathers in India, and then there you go, war starts. Uh, lots of naval battles and things like that. I guess that's going to happen, you know, ne next time, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. All right, well, that was first opium war, gunboat diplomacy. Obviously, British ships are way overpowered compared to the Chinese ships. So they are not even, you know, they are not even having some battles. They're just firing back and Chinese are just running away because they, they are that powerful. If you like my Rick's and Rufun, like, subscribe, check out the Rick's and 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 Rick's and